Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'll try to leave a good bit of time for questions because um, I'd like to know what y'all want to know about. A lot of this stuff is in the news. Uh, and if you go online, and Andy, there's some pretty good stories written about it, there's Andy Shane. Pretty good stories written about it sometimes. Andy. But you can go on the website, the DHEC website, and there's a whole lot of information on there, including this. And this is the one that has the total doses and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't have all the locations on it, but you can find those as well. There's nothing secret about it. But I thought I'd take it sort of from the top when it began and then go through where we are today just just very quickly as you remember the the virus started early in the year and we started reacting you remember the trump administration promised and did deliver manufacturers uh, uh, encouragement to produce vaccines and we have only two so far those are made by pfizer and by moderna there's some others coming along and those are the kinds we're giving shots with now in, in our state and everywhere else in the country. There's some more coming along. Johnson & Johnson is producing one, and Janssen another, and there may be some others as well that are coming along. So by March, we ought to have a lot more. Sometime mid-March, they promised us some time ago that we would have a lot more vaccine than we have now. Now we don't have enough for everybody who wants a shot. But also, we've not given all the shots that we have. And so we're working, we can do very little to increase the, our share or our flow that is coming into the state because that is set strictly by population, which was the best way for the federal government to do it. It's all coming from the federal government, no private sources, at least so far. So what happened when they made the first allocations and we got ours in December the 14th, all the, the hospitals and others are getting a shipment a, a, a week. Started off as two shipments. The first doses followed weeks later by the second doses. Now they're putting it all in one shipment, but they get a shipment every week. And it's the roughly, it was 30,000 Pfizer first doses, 30,000 second doses, and the same for Moderna, but it's stepped down. With Pfizer, you get uh, your second shot two weeks after the first one. With Moderna, you get your second shot either three or four weeks later, something like that. So it's coming in. Now, the original allocation that they chopped up at the federal government, they were confident they either had in what they called a stockpile or would be produced at a rate of 8.6 a million by Moderna and Pfizer combined was $50,000. 50, excuse me, 57 million uh, doses of the, of the two vaccines. Our share of that, based on our population, was about 1.5%, which came out to 822,000 doses, and that's what we're drawing down on now. now that's 1.5%, not of all the people in the state, which is about 5.1 million, but of those 18 and over, because the younger than that, if they get it, they don't show it. Uh, most of them don't get it, so it's not recommended for, people, for young people to begin with. So that is what has been coming in, and now it's coming in at about 120,000 doses a week. And just last week, the uh, Biden administration announced that Pfizer and Moderna, they had been trying to increase their dosage, and they, they succeeded just a couple of weeks ago in upping their production from 8.6 million to 10 million. So that means we'll get about 19,000 more doses per week, Moderna, and uh, Pfizer combined, mostly Moderna, until it continues to go up. But it's going to continue to go up, and as I said, in March, they are telling us, that if they've told us this from the beginning, that there'd be a lot more vaccine out there than there is now. So that's, that's good news. We've got the vaccine. It's coming in. It's not enough. But we need to see that we're using all that we have. So what we learned was, that, of course, the hospitals were the first places that DHEC assigned or allocated the vaccine to because they set up to get shots very quickly and most of them had the kind of refrigerating refrigerators that can keep a dose of vaccine at 158 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, which is about 70 degrees below zero centigrade. So that's what they did and those doses went out and as it began, the hospitals were not moving quite fast enough some moving a lot faster than others, but we encouraged them to step on it. And what we learned was very interesting. 
is that the hospital employees themselves were in that first category of people to get the shots. And, and the idea was that those who take care of those of us who may be in there dying from something need to be there to take care of those of us who in there may be dying from something. And it turned out that the average age of the death for COVID is 75 years old. So it's the older people. But just as those first shipments were coming down in mid-December, the CDC opened it up to first responders, EMTs, uh, firefighters, and those kind of people. Also, what do they have in common with the hospital employees? They keep us alive and protect us, and in many cases, get us to the hospital. So that was the emphasis, and that right now is Category 1A that you've heard about. Well, what we saw in the first few weeks surprised us, and that is only in the hospitals, only about a third of those who are eligible, which is, it was a lot of people, only about a third of them were actually getting the virus, getting the uh, vaccine. And another third were thinking about it. And about a third had said they were not interested. And we've seen that around the state as well since then. Although it's higher now in the hospital, is, it's over 50%, it may be way over 50% of those employees there. Um, I don't have the latest numbers on that, but there is a reluctance on the part of some people to get the virus, to get the vaccine. So of the 401 million that we have people that w w are eligible for the shot, there probably will be a lot of them that are not going to get it. And as you know, we've had about 350,000, maybe more than that, who have had the virus. As you know, the antibodies that, that build up. DHEC has estimated at one time that there may be those who get the virus that test positive for the virus may constitute only 20% of those that have it. That number, that estimate may be uh, way off. So there may be a lot of people that are immune that we don't know about. But in any event, we are confident that everybody in the state that is eligible is not going to come get the vaccine. So the hospital sped up. Um, when we saw that the people were not flowing through there as we thought, we uh, encouraged the hospitals. We, we opened it for 70 years old and above, knowing that 75 is the average age, and that caused a lot of folks to show up to get shots. The, the older people were a lot more interested than everybody else. So what, but what happened then was some of the hospitals had not allocated the personnel necessary to handle that kind of flow. So we encouraged them to, to consider, uh, if necessary, to consider putting off elective surgeries, if necessary, to get more people to give shots and to help with that process. I need to say is just giving the shots the easy part. It's getting everybody registered and, and then uh, the, the follow-up with them is uh, the hard part. Unfortunately, the federal government required registration of every dose of vaccine to be recorded in a computer system that is almost impossible to operate, having a lot of problems with that. They describe it as clunky, but we've called VAMS, but we've worked around that. And so we saw then that there were a lot of people going in and the hospitals needed some help. So um, we suggested that they consider eliminating those elective surgeries and some, some of them considered that, but they, they have brought in more and more people. The Emergency Management Division as well is seeking contracts to bring nurses and other people from all over, the, all over the country. But as you know, the whole country is looking for more nurses. So one thing we did a few weeks ago was uh, passed an order that allowed retired nurses, retired physicians, and medical students, anyone qualified to give a dose, to give a vaccine, which is not everybody, to go and do that. And as a result of that, we've had volunteers all over the place. Some of them contact DHEC directly, others contact the hospitals directly, and we've got a lot of volunteers coming in. But when we opened it up to the 70 year olds, that's when we really, things really got started. And what I'm hoping we can do, we're looking at the flow, checking the vaccine, and we're hoping that we can open it up to 65 and above uh, very soon. And then we'll, we'll also, the, the, Category 1B includes teachers and a lot of others. We want to get to that as soon as we can. The average age of a teacher in South Carolina is about 42 years old. 
Uh, the, uh, the figures vary. I've read in one place 59,000 teachers and another place 65,000. We are, there are a lot of teachers, uh, Judge Anderson, there are a lot of judges, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people in transportation, there are a lot of uh, people that, are, uh, that need to, to get that vaccination, but we got to take care of those in the most danger of dying from it first, and that is why we and the CDC has echoed this. We want to go to 65 and over, and we'll get the, just as quickly as we can get more vaccine, we'll keep on going with that. I'll be glad to read you some of these statistics. I might better wait and do that if, if you ask questions, but we've got right now, let's see, how many are on the shelf? We have about 150,000 doses that are on the shelf, that is, that have not been given. And there are three categories of locations, the hospitals, large and small, then pharmacies, and then the long-term care and nursing homes. CVS and Walgreens, their organizations, they are sending teams out to the long-term care facilities and nursing homes, and there's 750 of those. The other doses are going to the pharmacies that have signed up, about 600 have signed up, pharmacies, health centers, some doctor's offices, uh, fire stations, a few of those, about 600 of those have signed up, but right now, only, it looks like only about 230 of those are actually giving shots, but the rest should be coming online soon. And then that leaves the hospitals. But uh, Prisma, you may have noticed today, Prisma celebrated their 100,000th shot today uh, at, uh, over at the uh, at USC, over in the Gamecock Park. It was quite, a, quite an affair. That's a lot of, a lot of shots. And again, uh, we had, have mobile sites. Uh, the National Guard is very much involved setting up mobile sites just as they set it up. I think we got over 300 testing sites. And on that point, by the way, we've tested, I think we've tested close to 5 million people, but that's the whole population. But some of them have been tested twice or maybe three times. So we, we, if you want to get tested, there are plenty of testing sites out there. And if you're over 70, you can find a place uh, pretty easy, and pretty soon it'll be 65. That'll encompass a lot more people in this particular room. So I urge you to do that. Uh, I'll be glad to answer questions. Uh, again, oh, here's some good news of our younger, younger people from one year old through 19, through 19. We've had one death only in the state that was recently, and that was something called multi-system inflammatory sy uh, syndrome in children. It's not quite like COVID, but everyone it seems that has that disease uh, uh, also has, has COVID. So it's a, don't know if it's a contributing factor or what, but we have lost one. But other than that, strictly with COVID, we've lost no young people, no school age young people, and that is very, very good news, and that is why, that is one reason that we got to open these schools back up. Now, there are a lot of, lot of schools that just don't want to do it. They've got their reasons, but the evidence is mounting stronger and stronger that the schools are one of the safest places to be, and the reason, one, there are not a lot of reasons. One is because there are a lot of young people in the schools, and they either don't get it. If they do, they don't transmit it. Most of them don't get it. And the, the evidence that we've seen most recently from Charleston County School District, there were no, there's no evidence of the virus going from a student to a teacher. People get it outside the school, or some of the teachers or staff are giving it to each other. But again, that's only a ha handful, because the schools can be controlled, the flow of people. And we've offered PPE, personal protective equipment. We've offered everything. Uh, that any, any school district could want. Some have taken us up on it, some of them haven't. But you've all read the stories about the unintended consequences. The law of unintended consequences will always get you. And there are all sorts of unintended consequences of uh, very traumatic and serious impact among the young people by not being in school. So that's why we're pushing for that.